Great. Um, thanks. So um, I'm Corey Carpenter, an internet analyst at JP Morgan. And joining me this morning is Anjali Sud, CEO of Vimeo. Vimeo completed its spinoff from IC yesterday. So Anjali, thanks for uh, joining us during this busy time. Thank you, Corey. It is great to be here. I can't think of anything better I, I would want to be doing on, on day, officially day two as a public company. All right. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll click off with questions. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to submit one um, to ask, you can click on the blue ask a question button, um, type in your question, and, and we'll get to some at the end, uh, time committing. So um, Anjali, uh, Vimeo uh, was operated as, as part of IC uh, for many years now, uh, but it's just in, in day two as a standalone public company. Day one was, I guess, yesterday ringing the opening bell. So uh, given many people may still be newer to the story, uh, before we really dive into q and I thought it'd be helpful just to kick off with a quick recap of the business and the market opportunity that you're going after. Sure. Um, so I describe Vimeo as both a 16-year-old video platform and a three-year-old enterprise software startup. And that's because for most of its life, Vimeo was really the ad-free alternative to YouTube. So a, a video viewing destination but and, and a hosting platform that attracted a lot of filmmakers and video professionals who didn't want advertising on their work. Um, and uh, really what happened is back in 2017, we pivoted the strategy and um, saw this really exciting market opportunity that there was going to be a whole new class of creators. And previously, it was the professionals, the filmmakers. Um, uh, and then we actually saw the wave of consumers becoming creators. We're all, you know, on TikTok and using our phones to, to express ourselves with video. And we saw this, this next phase of video being businesses as the creator. So small businesses, um, teams within large organizations, and large companies themselves all starting to use video as a cornerstone of communication the same way they're using email or chat or, or text. Um, and so we embarked um, and have been over the last few years on being a B2B software company, um, specifically providing a whole set of tools in an integrated all-in-one solution that puts professional quality video in the hands of companies and businesses. Um, and, you know, obviously we, we went public yesterday, uh, you know, today we, we have, I would say, very successfully completed that pivot, both from a product perspective, as well as if you look at the underlying business. Some quick stats in Q1, uh, we grew revenue about 57% year on year, we're at over a $350 million um, annual revenue run rate. Uh, our, our gross margins um, have been increasing, we were at 72% in Q1, we were profitable um, in Q1, though we are investing heavily this year in R&D and in a sales force. Um, we have about 1.6 million paying subscribers or customers that um, customer gr growth is up about 25% year over year. And then underlying within the business, we have this enterprise offering where we're actually starting to sell um, our capabilities. We've primarily been selling them on a self-serve basis through a freemium model. We've started to actually expand and, and have a sales force go, go out and sell our tools. That part of the business is um, on fire. It's, you know, that our enterprise revenue is up 100% year on year for the last three quarters. And you're seeing customers like Amazon and Rite Aid and Starbucks and Intuit um, uh, sort of start using our tools. Um, you know, other other sort of key stats on the business, you know, our, our you know, economics are healthy, our LTV to CAC is, is north of 4X. Um, our retention very strong, this is a sticky product, product engagement high, we have a, a good percentage of our customers coming in and using the tools on a weekly, monthly basis. Um, and, you know, I think as we look forward uh, to your question on market opportunity, we believe that we are just in the very, very early innings of this market and we kind of define who our target customer is as really any business, small business, or team or, or organization in the world. And, you know, the reason that we, that we think that is if you just think about what video is as a medium, it's uh, highly engaging, um, immersive, real-time, emotive, and there's so much power in expressing things with video. And we know this. We know that video gets higher clicks, um, higher engagement. It gets prioritized in social media feeds. It helps your distributed teams feel closer together. Yet if you actually look, the vast majority of companies, even the largest Fortune 100 companies, are not using video today and particularly professional quality video, edited, branded, beautiful video. And why is this? Because it is still too hard. If you are a small business and you want to produce a, um, a beautiful, branded, professionally produced video for Instagram, it would cost you thousands of dollars and take weeks using our current, the current tool sets in the ecosystem. And that just doesn't make sense. You're not going to do that every day for a post on Instagram that has a shelf life of a couple of days. On the enterprise side, it's amazing. I talk to so many CEOs, um, and if you actually look at most of the ways companies are using, you know, or are communicating today, um, you know, it's not just what, what Zoom has done in video conferencing has done with meetings, but it's every other touch point that still has not become video first. Um, there's, you know, uh, town halls are not engaging. Webinars are boring. Um, video content is distributed on hard drives and in the cloud all throughout um, your organization by different teams. It's not all housed in one searchable, secure place. Um, there's just a lot of really like legacy kind of infrastructure that we think can be easily solved through Vimeo. And so when we look at the market opportunity ahead, we're really building an all-in-one software solution that reduces all of this friction and makes professional quality video 
um, extremely accessible and in the hands of every single employee at a company, as well as every single small business in the world. Um, and there are over 300 million businesses in the world. We have again 1.6 million paying customers. So we see the market as early, growing fast, and one in which we can take meaningful share. So um, I think you know the shift of video is you know, undoubtedly something that was you know happening, uh, but I think you know probably accelerated some of the trends over, over the past year or so. What have been some of your key learnings? Uh, maybe through the pandemic and, and maybe more importantly, you know, what are you seeing in terms of customer behavior um, just as the work environment starts to uh, normalize a little bit? Yeah, um, so I'd say uh, in terms of key learnings, uh, internally as a company, I think we've learned to scale while having a remote workforce. Uh, you know, we have grown pretty substantially uh, and will and continue to hire um, significantly across the teams right now, just given the opportunity ahead of us. And, you know, I, I obsess about execution uh, because I think we have um, sort of a very, very clear validation on the market. And it's all about how we execute to, to go after it. Um, and I think we've, we've gotten some really good learning. I think we, we've learned how to hire quickly. We learned how to onboard and set our team members up to be productive quickly. That translates in a lot of the efficiency and the LTV to CAC that you see. Um, and we've gotten smarter and better at sort of organizing to serve our users. We have two core segments of customers, the smallest business and then the largest company. Um, very different DNA, very different go-to-market, but also very similar synergistic product platform. And so we're getting really good at building the product to be sort of one single integrated platform, but going to market in more targeted, tailored, and efficient ways. Um, so I think really good learnings there. In terms of the market and, and customers, um, you know, I think what we've learned is that our hypothesis is correct. Small businesses, if you ask them, you can choose between posting a video or posting an image or text. They will choose video every single day of the week, but you got to make it easy for them. We launched a tool called Vimeo Create. Um, it's a mobile app that allows you in just a couple minutes and clicks to create a branded, um, professionally produced video that has um, motion graphics and licensed music and stock footage um, and is optimized for performance. That app um, helped power over a million videos in Q1 alone from these small businesses. So we know that when we put the tool in the hands of that small business, they will adopt video. Huge learning for us. On the enterprise side, what we're seeing is obviously since the pandemic, more companies are accelerating their digital transformation. They're more open to being video first. And they're, again, good, good sort of validation in the power of video. Um, a lot of HR teams, comms teams are finding that when they use video, employees are more engaged. They have a stronger feeling of confidence and affinity with the company. They retain knowledge and information better. Um, so everything from training to compliance to, you know, um, employee morale is all being improved. Those outcomes are being improved through video. Um, in terms of customer behavior, what we see on the platform, you know, this was an area I probably had the most sort of question marks about as we lapped the pandemic a few months ago, because last March we saw a huge uptick in the number of customers coming in. Our cohorts got a lot bigger. And there's always that question of, okay, as we reopen, as the world returns, what will happen to those customers? I'm very happy to report that we are seeing very, very um, positive, solid signals here um, in a couple key areas. One, retention, both um, the cohorts, how they are retaining right now, since we now have a couple months of, of those COVID cohorts that have come up on their year renewal, as well as leading indicators of retention, product engagement and usage, um, the percentage of, of our subscribers who are you know, choosing auto, auto renew off, they're turning off their auto renew, all those signals are effectively indicating that these cohorts are just as engaged and sticky as the cohorts that we had before the pandemic. Um, and that's probably the most critical thing for a business like ours. Uh, we are a SaaS business. A huge percentage of, of, our, of our revenue is, is from our, our prior cohorts. Um, and, and that is looking really strong. And ultimately underlying that, Corey, what, what, it, what we're seeing is, is this notion that video is working for people. So even as they plan to come back, they see it no, not as an or, but an and. Right. So if you're the yoga instructor and you've been live streaming your classes and now you're making money on a with a digital class offering, you're, of course, going to want to come back to in-person classes, but you're not going to turn away that additional revenue that you got from live streaming and reaching people who aren't physically there. Same for performing arts. If you're a small business and you've suddenly started to use video in your posts, you're not going to randomly go back to no video just because your, your store is reopened. And if you're a large company and you were forced to live stream your town halls and your trainings because your team was distributed, even if you're office first, even if you're going to have everybody come back, which most companies are not doing, you still have a distributed workforce. You have teams in different places. You have people who are out of the office sometimes or on vacation. And the notion that you would just host a physical event and not capture it with video and record it and have it hosted on your site so that anyone can access it again whenever they want, that is, not, that is a mindset that I think we, that ship has sailed. And I don't see any indication that, that companies are going to go back. Okay, that's helpful. Um, in terms of you know opportunity ahead, um, I think you're, you're you know you've alluded to at one point you know just one to two million subscribers out of 300 million businesses, 40 billion dollar TAM that's growing you know fast. Um, what are your top two or three strategic priorities kind of over the next six to 12 months? 
So we have two priorities. First and foremost, expanding within the enterprise. That enterprise business I mentioned growing 100% year on year. It's about 25% of our revenue today. And we have a very small, small percentage of the potential market here. We have about 4,400 enterprise customers. These are customers who we reach through our sales force. Within our own user base alone, our free user base alone, we know that nearly 70% of Fortune 500 companies have a company account on Vimeo and aren't paying us today. So big opportunity to just better connect our own user base through product in a bottoms up fashion, better sort of qualify and connect those customers to these enterprise products that we offer. The other thing we're doing in the enterprise is significantly expanding our product suite. One of the most interesting things that happened in the last year is all these enterprise customers came to us for things like live streaming their town halls and events, but then they quickly also were knocking on our door asking for a suite of other capabilities that we did not have. We've spent the last year building those capabilities and you're going to see us launch in our roadmap several new use cases this year that expands how Vimeo can serve every department and organization. Great example is last week we launched a corporate video library solution. This is a way for a company to take all of their video content and centralize it in one place. It is branded, um, beautifully cinematic, feels like a Netflix experience, which is what employees want. Um, it's secure. You can set different permissioning. You can track how people are engaging with different content and it's searchable. All of that content is being transcribed, captioned, and then easily searchable. So if you had someone on the HR team who wants to find, you know, when, when the CEO said X at this town hall versus the marketing team who wants to say, oh, I want to search for that video that we used for X campaign, that's all happening in one central hub. That's just one example, Corey. You're going to see us go in and rethink webinars, rethink virtual events, launch a whole host of team capabilities. Um, and we basically see this as we have an opportunity to have sort of wall-to-wall -wall adoption within an organization so that every employee and team can be using video in a way they haven't before. That's priority number one. Priority number two, the small business, video is still way too hard for them. So we are going to be constantly looking to simplify video for the small business. That involves improving our free offering. The number one barrier for small businesses is actually just creating a piece of content. We want them to do that for free on Vimeo, and then we can upsell them and convert them to being a paying customer through things like having their branding, having advanced analytics, being able to distribute that content um, all over the web. So you'll see us do a lot there. The other thing you'll see us do and on the innovation side is keep working on how we can make uh, the time and effort required to create content to make that lower, while also improving the quality and the performance of that content. We collect data around how videos perform based on where they are, the colors, the, the length, the pacing, the music, um, and we want to take that data and productize it so that actually we can say to a small business, if you make a video using Vimeo's tool, it's going to get X percent higher clicks because our, our AI and sort of engine is taking that data and using it um, to, to help you produce that, those videos. So um, you'll also see us on the small business side expand the types of videos being created. Today, most small businesses are using us to make videos for social media, but they should also be using us to make videos for their website, for customer support to demo their products. Um, so all of that is, is sort of coming in, in the roadmap as well. So those are the two priorities for us. Um, you know, we're almost halfway through the year and I feel very confident and good about where we are as against the goals that we set out for 2021. We are shipping the products on, on sort of the timelines that we expected. Um, we're hiring our sales force, we're expanding pretty substantially and, that, and we're doing it in a very efficient way. Um, so I think we have a very good sort of on target momentum to achieve our goals this year. So I wanna spend some time on the enterprise side um, you know, if we look at the, just the market opportunity, I think at least today it's roughly half of the TAM, but it's growing much faster. You just mentioned it's, it's only 25, roughly 25% of your revenue. Um, so, um, you know, it's, and it's been growing 100% year over year. So kind of to start, you know, what's been working so well on the enterprise side recently to get this momentum? I, mean, I think one of the questions we get most frequently is, what is the enterprise, um, you know, use case for Vimeo today? Um, so I'll start with the, the second part, which is the use case. So in general, when we look at large organizations, they're really trying to use video for two things. One, they want to use video to communicate externally with their customers, um, as well as other stakeholders, investors, um, partners, et cetera. Two, they want to use video to communicate internally with their employees and their teams to increase productivity and engagement and collaboration. Uh, what we provide is an integrated all-in-one solution to do Eat both of those things in one platform. Um, and, uh, and, and it's intuitive. It's simple. It's a very consumer UX that's being put in an enterprise environment with all the things you need at enterprise grade, quality, security, et cetera. And what we're finding is that value proposition is really resonating because, again, for most companies, if you have to have one team using one software, and another team using another software, and the pieces aren't talking to each other, it's still too hard. They're not going to adopt video at scale if it's not super simple. You need your employees to actually want to use the tools and technology. So having the brand and the UX be wonderful, which is something Vimeo has done extremely well over the years, is actually a huge added factor. 
And then you want bottoms up adoption. You know, you want to be able to say, we are, we are never looking to be the kind of company that we have to have an army of salespeople out there selling for nine months to close a big, you know, big deal. This is a very kind of bottoms up scalable motion. And so we have this freemium model. We have the ability to put our enterprise tools in the hands of employees for free. And then as they naturally adopt these tools and collaborate as a team and start sharing, then we have the ability to have sort of our sales team go and convert them. Um, so those are kind of, you know, sort of the, the big um, areas in, in, in that we're really focused on that we think are really exciting. Um, I can tell you that we're seeing really strong momentum. Our sales pipeline is, is very healthy. Our days to close are short. We have about a three-week sales cycle today. Um, and and the, probably the most interesting, exciting thing is all of this momentum that you're seeing on enterprise is coming from today quite a narrow use case. So the vast majority of our enterprise customers really are using us to live stream events internally, like town halls, as well as externally conferences, events. Um, to reach their customers. Um, and that's great. That's great. That's, that's allowed us to deliver all the growth and the healthy NRR that we have. But again, as I said, those customers are telling us that they want other things that they are willing to pay for. And we haven't been able to deliver that yet. And you'll see us start to do that very steadily this year. So you know, I've been at Vimeo for seven years. I've never had a roadmap with so much market validation where it's you're not you're not imagining what people want they're literally telling you that they need these capabilities and tools and they can't get it um, and it wasn't you know a heavy lift for us to be able to deliver them within a year we've been building and we're well on track so you know that's kind of how how I, I think about the business the only other thing I would say on the enterprise side is we are still quite early in our go to market you know, we are not yet best in class. The types of companies that we look at and aspire to, to sort of be like are, are sort of more of the Atlassian model, very bottoms up, um, free sort of product driven model of qualifying leads and then turning them into enterprise customers. It's really interesting. Um, about 70% of our new enterprise customers in Q1 started as free or self-serve users, but which sounds impressive, sounds like the model is working, but actually most of those customers were raising their hands and coming to us as against us having a very clear sort of, um, you know, X customer has this corporate domain, they have this number of teams, we flag them in our system, it goes into Salesforce, sales team picks up the phone. That model has not, we haven't really gotten that going yet. So I think that's a really major growth lever for us. Um, and you'll see us really try and ignite that um, in, in sort of the next few quarters. Okay. I want to talk a bit about um, shifts to the international opportunity. Um, you know, maybe help us with what, what is your international presence today? And video is certainly a very uh, global need. Um, and how should we think about um, your, your ambitions and expansion plans outside the U.S.? So uh, international is uh, absolutely a big opportunity. We are uh, over 50% of our business and users um, at Vimeo are outside of the U.S. today. But there's a couple key pockets of opportunity. On the sort of SMB or, or self-serve side of the business, what we see is that our conversion rates outside the U.S. are about half that of within the U.S. So we know that we need to do a better job of having, you know, translated, localized experiences, the right payment methods, um, the right marketing um, in, in each of these regions. Um, and, and you'll see us, we, we've invested quite a bit this year in making some improvements. So you'll see us look to improve that conversion rate. Uh, and just given the scale there, if we can improve that conversion rate, a point uh, or two, that, that can have real, real implications um, for us. On the enterprise side, we're about two-thirds of our business is in the U.S., and, uh, and we have a very nascent but quickly growing sales force um, in the UK in covering our EMEA region. Uh, this year, you are, you're going to see us um, sort of double down in that region. We're growing very quickly, the, 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 the sales force there. We certainly see demand outpacing our ability to serve it with the current sales force. And then you'll also see us take that same model and replicate it in a few other regions. We've already set up um, our first boots on the ground in APAC um, in Asia. And then you'll also see us do the same in LATAM. Um, and so, you know, definitely real opportunity. Zooming out, I think the big, the big sort of takeaway is, as you said, video is a global need. And what we're finding is that while we have to do some work on the enterprise side to get product market fit in these different regions, some product work and some marketing work, it's not a ton of work. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an incremental lift, but it's not one that requires such a significant investment that it's not something we should be able to just sort of rinse and repeat and do. Um, and so that's promising. Um, and I do expect over time Vimeo's business to continue to become more and more international. Uh, and, and just, you know, what I think is most exciting is there is no one region that's sort of, you know, more bespoke or require or sort of has a bigger opportunity. Uh, every single region in the world has businesses and each of those businesses wants to use video um, because that, that that power is so ubiquitous. Um, I want to talk about competition for a bit. Yep. Um, maybe if you could just help us with, I think you've mentioned YouTube before, as, as often sometimes your biggest competitor. So what is the competitive, you know, who are you competing with basically? And when you're winning these new clients, you know, are, are they coming from other customers or are these, you know, are they totally new, basically adding new capabilities? 
So uh, we don't really have one direct competitor today. As I said, you know, one of the things that we do so well is we have this extremely broad integrated solution that lets you do all these different things with video. And so because of that breadth and the focus in video, there really is no direct competitor today. What, what we see is that for different parts of the use cases, there may be a niche competitor, a point solution, um, or there's just a free alternative that, like a YouTube, but that, lets, that has significant kind of um, constraints in terms of what you can do. But what's really interesting, if you look at what we replace, what is the alternative? It's actually very rarely another software provider provider in video, the vast, vast majority of the time, and this is true for both small businesses and large companies, they're not using video at all, period. And, um, and, and this is really about getting them to use it for the very first time. So what we're really selling against is the friction and that sort of lack of inertia to go and adopt this medium because it feels too complex or expensive or intimidating. Um, there are, of course, times when we do have direct competition, and typically when that happens, we win based on having the breadth of capabilities and all-in-one solution, the quality of the technology and tools, simplicity of the UX, and having all of that in um, a price point that's very accessible. But I can tell you that we rarely find ourselves in situations where we're in sort of a very directly competitive bake-off and we're losing because of sort of a one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, the reality is the ecosystem, particularly on the enterprise side, is very legacy. These are products designed for large companies that are high touch, require custom services, you know, dropping in whole teams. And because of that, they're extremely expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. We're taking all of that and putting it in this really simple platform. And even if we're selling it on to, through a sales force, it's still a self-serve experience at a very uh, affordable price point for, for companies. Um, and so I think the combination of that has been one that we're seeing a lot of traction in, and it's reflected in our growth rates and in our customer um, count. Um, even after a lot of partnerships over the past few years, maybe it feels like more you know, more and more recently, GoDaddy, MailChimp, Shopify, you know, many, many more, many more. Um, how big of a channel um, are these partnerships for you? And, you know, how impactful should we think um, they are to the business today or, or could be over time? But today, today, partnerships are a relatively small part of our business, but we believe and what we're seeing is that it, this can be a real um, substantial acquisition channel for us in the future. So we are investing heavily in our partnerships strategy this year. Um, the, the, the sort of strategy in general is, and it goes back to the market, if most of the market isn't yet using video, uh, then we need to get Video and Vimeo in the hands of businesses wherever they are, is, as opposed to be having to wait to attract them to Vimeo um, themselves. So what we've done is we've natively integrated a lot of our tools and capabilities into platforms like GoDaddy with the idea, and we're actually providing it for free. We're not licensing that technology on a white label basis. Instead, we're providing it for free with our branding. So it says powered by Vimeo within these these um, interfaces, and then we're asking our part our partners will help you create you know, your users can create one or two videos for free. But then once they want to create more content or they want to add their branding, we're asking those partners to push that customer to Vimeo directly within their product. And then that becomes a very scalable, efficient customer acquisition for us. What we've seen so far is that that model is working. We are able to both add value to these partners and they're excited to do this kind of deal with us. Uh, it's, it's winning for the partner. They're, they're happy with the experience. Their users are engaged with video on their platform and they didn't have to go and invest to try and do video themselves, which is extremely hard. And it's working for us. We're seeing a good volume of new users come in who we are then able to convert at a healthy level into subscribers. Um, it is still early days. You know, it takes time to kind of build out each of these partnerships and then for each of them to scale. But you will see us launch more partnerships in the future um, that are really um, it, you know, use, utilizing this model. And I expect that in 2022, you'll start to see the impact of this very explicitly in our numbers and in, in the PL. So, do you want to talk about the numbers for a little bit, maybe save, save for last? Um, so you, you did lay out some you know, financial targets uh, at, at investor day before going public. Um, you expect revenue to grow at 30% plus uh, CAGR in the next five years. Um, what gives you the most confidence in your ability to reach these targets? And then on the flip side, <clears throat> excuse me, where do you see the most uh, execution risk? Um, I think you know, we, we feel very confident as I sit here today, as I'm more confident than ever around the targets that we've provided. Underlying that 30 plus percent growth rate is really an assumption around both sub growth and then ARPU growth. And the way sort of the simplest terms, sub growth is really going to be driven by our ability to uh, um, acquire small businesses at the SMB sort of piece on, from a freemium perspective. And there, you know, as I said, see the, the traction that we're seeing in partnerships, the improvements we're making on product, the fact that we already have a very healthy freemium funnel, over 60% of our subscribers start for free. We see extremely healthy rollover rates in our free trials. Like we know that when we get the product in the hands of people, they like it, they try it, and then they buy. So you're going to just see us continue to grow there. But that the sort of signals are that this is a, this is a uh, sort of a model that, that we can make work. Um, and then on the ARPU side, that's really coming from enterprise uh, as that business scales. Um, and as I said there, you know, we, we started the year with uh, 
75 set sellers on our sales force. Our target was to double that number to 150 by the end of this year. We, uh, you know, halfway through the year, we're increasing that number and we expect to now grow even more than that while maintaining very healthy sales efficiency. So, I, you know, all the signals that we're seeing tell us that we should be able to do that. Um, so I think, you know, overall, when I look at the market and, and I and I just say, okay, we have 4,400 enterprise customers today and just look at how many more um, tens of thousands there are in our own base alone that we've already identified, much less in the world, um, that, that all feels very achievable. In terms of execution risk, I feel um, very good about our ability to hire and expand the team. As I mentioned, operationally, we've really set ourselves up for scale. I think the biggest execution risk will um, will always be product. Um, and you know, it, it is it is one thing to hit a roadmap and hit a timeline to ship a product, but as we all know, amazing, great products comes down to so many things, deeply understanding the customer, getting the pricing and packaging rights, um, making sure the UX is actually um, working and, and really solving a need. And what I can tell you I've learned here is that you often don't get it right, right out of the gate. It takes iteration and it takes time. So the way I think about this business in general, I think there is very little risk um, from a sort of market perspective, from a strategy perspective, um, I think that is just all tailwinds and momentum. And I think on the execution side, it's really a matter of when, not if. I know we will get the product right. We've done this many times before, um, and we have an excellent product DNA. The only thing I don't know is will we get every product right right out of the gate, or will it take us a couple quarters to iterate, adjust the pricing, adjust the UX? Um, and I expect it'll be a little bit of both, but um, just given how much we have in the hopper and how well we're, we're sort of moving right now, um, I, feel, I feel very confident. I want to ask. So you're starting with, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you're starting with oh, a little over 300 million of cash and no debt. Um, so it's certainly a good, a good, a good start post spin. Um, you know, how should we kind of think about um, your strategy around M&A? You've been inquisitive in the past. Um, you know, now that you're a standalone public company, you know, how do, how do you think about that? And maybe more just broadly capital, capital allocation. Um, on the capital allocation side, uh, you know, our, our growth trajectory and outlook is all based or, on organic investment. Um, and, you know, again, where you'll, you'll see us invest this year as well as in the future, first and foremost in R&D, um, it all comes down to building a great product that reduces friction. Second, in our sales force and expanding the enterprise side. And then third, in marketing. Um, and there, you know, it's, we do see a lot of opportunity. So most of the world doesn't actually think of Vimeo as a B2B software company. Um, and we certainly have work to do to, to sort of increase awareness. But I think all three of those buckets are ones where we will continue to allocate capital capital organically to drive growth. Um, M&A and sort of non-organic levers are, 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 to your point, ones that we have taken advantage of before and will certainly look um, always opportun opportunistically to do. Um, I put it in a couple buckets, the types of, of areas that we're interested in. One is actually talent and institutional knowledge. So aqua hires, um, getting access to IP um, in, in very complex future areas of video that we might not have a ton of expertise in. You know, we, we, we've invested in live streaming, we've invested in AI through M&A and it has been extremely successful for us. So what are the next areas of video that if we go out a couple of years, we think can be huge and who are sort of the um, entrepreneurs who are on the forefront of that, that we can um, be involved in. So that's one area. The other is, um, just expanding our TAM. Uh, the reality is there's so much opportunity in video today. Literally every communication touch point that a business has, you can imagine where video could play a role. It should play a role. And we obviously constantly have to prioritize and focus. And so what we will always look at areas where perhaps we've said for our plan, this is an interesting area, but we're going to put it on the side. We're going to deprioritize it and not look at it this year. If we have an opportunity to work with another company to get us into that market, that's absolutely one we'll look at. And the last thing I'll say is I do expect, and the industry is, is quite fragmented. As I said, we don't have one direct competitor today, and there are a lot of niche point solutions out there. Um, it'll be interesting to see as the year progresses how the market evolves, and I do think we're well positioned to be opportunistic if there is consolidation, um, uh, to sort of take advantage of that where it makes sense. So we'll certainly look at M&A as we always do, but not um, as a sort of required growth lever for us to achieve our goals. Awesome. Well, I, I'm told that we're one minute over. So um, thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy week, as I'm sure. Uh, for doing this and uh, hopefully we can have you again next year. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Corey. All right. Bye.